Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Praise the Lord. I'm grateful this morning for the opportunity to bring the speaker. Isn't that an honor? Yes. My name is Peter Macharia, um, and this is Anne Macharia. Uh, and between us, we are blessed with three beautiful ladies. Please raise your hands. There is precious June and Quincy. We have the honor and the privilege to bring them this morning. So we are grateful to God for giving us an opportunity to hear what he has prepared for us this morning. Because I can assure you, God has his, lead, his vessel lady. And he has a message for each one of us. It is for us to open our hearts, our minds, to receive from what the Lord has prepared for us. And therefore, I will not take much, but to pray for the minister of the word this morning, so that from there God uh, can use her to speak to us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the gift of life and health. And thank you, the Lord, you have gathered us this morning, Father, to hear from you and to hear what you have prepared, King of Glory, for each one of us. Thank you, Jehovah God, because you have prepared your face, King of Glory, that will be used of you this morning. And we thank you, Father, because, Lord in heaven, she will be able to communicate that which you have meant for each one of us. We honor you and we worship you. For this we pray, believe, and trust in Jesus' name. Amen. Please let's clap our hands as we welcome Anne to speak. Thank you. Let's have our seats. Please let's have our seats. Good morning, church. Uh, I'm born again this morning. I love the Lord so, so much. I'm grateful for grace and where he found me. I walk in him has been the best experience. Through it all, ups and downs, he has been God. I have known him as a father and as a friend, as the singer says. So as I stand here, I'm grateful. Thank you, our Reverend Aris and our Bishop Kemani for trusting me with the pulpit. And I pray that God is going to minister to us this morning. Now, we've had the ladies week, and our theme has been what? Powerful instruments aligned to purpose. And then we have our overall theme, that is we are going to do what? To thresh mountains. So I want to bring a convergence to the two. And today we are looking at threshing mountains and leaving our purpose amidst opposition. One as a few because we will thresh mountains, we will be aligned and leave our purposes irrespective of what is happening. Now I want us to look at a story that is in the book of First Kings. First Kings chapter 1. And it's quite a long scripture, but I, 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 when I was thinking about it, I thought uh, we could read the way Nehemiah and Ezra after the dedication, or after the children of Israel had come from exile, and uh, they were there, they were gathered. They had not had scriptures being read for a long, long, long time. And that day, they read the scriptures from morning up to midday, studying. I thought of something like that, but uh, we don't have that time. So let's read uh, First Kings chapter one. So we'll read verse one. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exhorted himself. Okay, we start with one. <laughs> now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Huh? He was cold. Ah, yeah, verse 5. <laughs> verse 5. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exhorted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Verse 7. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiada the priest, and they, following Adonijah, helped him. Okay, verse 11. Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? 12 to 14. Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel, that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. 
Go and get thee unto King David and say unto him, Didst not thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? Verse 25, uh, verse 14, okay. Behold, while thou talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy words. For he is gone down this day, and hath slain oxen, and fat cattle, and sheep, and in abundance, and hath caught all the king's sons, and the captains of the hosts, and Abiyah the priest. And behold, they eat and drink before him, and say, God save King Adonijah. Verse 30, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him their king over Israel, and blow ye with a trumpet, and say, God save King Solomon. Then you shall come after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne, for he shall be king in my stead, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Thank you so much. Now, the whole of this chapter, First Kings chapter 1, is about David. Now the Bible says, our king, who God had installed so powerfully and anointed by Samuel, now he has grown very old, very, very old. And he cannot even keep warm by himself. So there has to be other strategies that are brought in to really help him live longer. It was accepted. It was medicine. I was reading somewhere, they were saying that was supposed to be a medical sort of procedure. Bring somebody who is younger to keep him warmer, that he may live longer. In those times, it was accepted. And that is what they do for the king. Now, his son, Adonijah, the one that we have just read about, is the oldest surviving son. By now, the firstborn son called Amnon, remember he raped Tamar, and Absalom organized, that is the second son, organized for his mother. And he's gone. Amnon is dead. Now there's another son in between called Chileab. Chileab is only mentioned once. It is said that he might have died when he was a young man. Then come Absalom. Absalom wanted to be king, and he really was after it. He almost divided the father's kingdom and stuff like that. But Joab, the commander-in-chief of David at that time, organized, and Absalom is killed. So Adonijah, the fourth son, whose mother is Haggith, the Bible says he also now wants to take power. Now remember, before this, there has not been hereditary kingship. You know, theirs was a theocracy. God appointed the king. But Adonijah, the Bible says there, are, there were many things that were really favoring him. He looked good as Absalom looked. Those of us who read Bible stories, you can see the physical depiction of Absalom. Eh? He looked like that. And he had a lot of support with him. So Adonijah organizes a lot of people. Now on his side, he wants to stage a coup. He's aware because Solomon had been declared, or David had said in another verse that we're going to look at, and he knows that he's not supposed to be taking the throne. Now the throne belongs to somebody else, and it belongs to Solomon. But he organizes, and he calls people, and one of the key supporters that he has on his side is Joab, David's good friend and commander-in-chief. Then he also has Abiathar, 
the chief priest in Israel. And then he has all the king's sons, apart from Solomon and his mother, Bathsheba. So he has a lot of support. So he gathers Israel, and then he declares himself king. And then he slaughters a lot of goats, sheep, and there is feasting at this time. And he has declared himself king. And as we have read, they are saying, long live king who? Adonijah. Now, I want us to look at, hold it there, in First Chronicles 28, verse 1 to 8. First Chronicles 28, verse 1 to 8. And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by cause, and the captains over the thousands, and captains over the hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king, and his sons with the officers, and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. How be it the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler and of the house of Judah, the house of my father and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as this, at this day. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. Now, that is David's passing the torch in public. You know, putting a rubber stamp on what God had told him, that he wasn't going to build the temple, but Solomon was going to do it, and Solomon was going to be king. And there is no doubt about that. The Lord spake, as our version is saying, and the torch is being, had been passed publicly so that everybody may know. Normally we say when you are delegating, when you are leaving something to someone in the office, everyone has, has to know so that they can honor that. And this is what David is doing. He has gathered who is who. The leaders, the commanders, the children of Israel publicly and saying, this is it. This is the son who will be king after me as the Lord had spoken. Now think about that and the events that are happening in First Kings when David is almost an invalid. And Adonijah has declared himself king. He has slaughtered the fat lambs. And people are eating and feasting and saying, long live king, Adonijah. Adonijah is almost succeeding in becoming king. But remember, God had already spoken. And therefore, a friend of David called Nathan. Nathan was a, a prophet. Huh? The first time we meet him is during David, <laughs> when he was walking around the temple, and he sees a beautiful woman showering called Bathsheba. Whatever happens, happens. Nathan is the one who comes to rebuke him. 
but they remain good friends. He takes it very kindly. So Nathan is aware of all what is happening. So what does he do? He goes to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. When, Adon when everybody is singing and saying, long live Adonijah the king, and everybody is eating and feasting, and there's a loud voice. It wasn't a quiet thing. And everybody is scared. Now remember, David is very old. He seems even not to be aware of what is happening. So Nathan decides to stand up and do something. The Bible says he did not go with a prophecy, neither did God speak to him. He knew what God had said. So what he does, he goes and speaks to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and reminds her of God's promise that God had said that Solomon was to be king. So he tells Bathsheba, you go and speak to David and remind him of the promise of God and what he had committed himself to do as David in 1 Chronicles 28, that he was handing over his kingdom to Solomon. So that is what Bathsheba does. And David subverts the whole thing. Now, there was a man of God in the name of Nathan, this prophet, who had not followed Adonijah, and another high priest called Zadok. Now, David tells Nathan and Zadok to anoint Solomon and to have him ride on his mule. Mules were rare. A mule is a crossbreed between a donkey and a, <laughs> and a horse. The law had forbidden the children of Israel about crossbreeding animals. So mules were normally imports and they were very expensive, very, very expensive because Israelites could not crossbreed. So this is the animal that, uh, or rather the, 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 the symbol of power, a very expensive thing that Solomon is riding on. He puts on the king's robe and he's declared the king. And the Bible says, towards the end of 1 Kings chapter 1, when people heard, when Adonijah and his camp heard the noise that was being made and other people singing, Solomon is king and he's riding on the king's mule and he has the king's people with him because not everybody had gone for Adonijah. The Bible says that Adonijah's camp, what they decided to do, they feared, they asked, what is that that we are hearing? And everybody dispersed, I mean dispersed. And you know what Adonijah did? Eh? Despite having declared himself king and having the commander-in-chief and the high priest Abiathar on his side, he cowed. He feared. Everybody left. He had to go and hold the horns at the temple to be saved by Solomon later. Because God is God. I don't need to look like he was succeeding, but he did not. Now, I want to say, my brothers and sisters, that God's purpose and intent and will is inherent in each and every one of us. Every one of us has a purpose. God has a will over our lives. And he predestined this a long time ago. Okay? We are not just existing and occupying space and coming to church and going home and waiting for old age. Now God has a purpose, has a will, and that will come to pass. However, it faces a lot of opposition. And this is not the only time that God's will and purposes have faced opposition. Okay. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, I want us to look at the fact that God has a predestined purpose and will for all of us. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, I knew you before I formed you, Okay, before I formed thee in the belly, in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. In 29:11, I know the plans I have for you, 
saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end and all that. Now, God has a purpose and a plan. In Romans 8.30, and those he predestined, he also called. Yeah. Those whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called them, he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. John 10.10, 10. the thief cometh not but for steal and kill to destroy, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now the plans and the thoughts of God over our lives are good and they are perfect. One as if you and he predestined, he put it inside us even before we were born. There is a purpose. And we need to realize that God's purpose is perfect. It is good. And his will over our lives is to give us a future and a hope. Even in our families, as we demonstrate the kingdom of God, his purpose is to give us a future and a hope. However, just like in Solomon's case, the Lord having himself told the king that this will be the king, your son Solomon will be the king, there is such great opposition. Look at the people who have come up. First of all is Absalom. Then we have Adonijah. So in the same way, God's purposes and will face opposition. So as we pursue our purpose and we seek to fulfill the will of God in our lives, we'll face opposition. Now let's look at it. How has it been? Even before Adonijah tries to hoist himself and declare him king and looking like he's succeeding. Now look at the human race at Eden. Now God creates Adam and Eve, and Christ, the human race, that we may worship. We have such a, a harmonious coexistence, a peaceful one. And you can look at the picture of the Garden of Eden and how God visited in the evening. That is how things were supposed to be. And the Bible says, he had said, let us create man in our own image and likeness. That was supposed to be the status. But what did the devil do? He came, cheated Eve and Adam, we were thrown out of the garden of what? Of Eden. Now look at the children of Israel. Now God wants to, God had made a promise through Abraham that he was to bless the nations of the earth through them. But look at how they are held by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh looks like he's bent on not having them live. Now, during the time of Esther and Mordecai, now the king has even issued a decree that all the Jews were to be annihilated. And normally kings, once they declared something, nobody was to come and unsay it. But look at God. Mordecai and Esther, God used them and the children of Israel are saved. Now look at somebody like David. David was a very young man eh, when he is anointed to be king. Now after the field, eh, he comes and God makes a demonstration of the king through him by ensuring that he kills God yet the field's time in front of everybody. Therefore, God like lifting a pedestal for, for him. And everybody may know that this is the king that I have anointed and a warrior. Immediately after that, he spends 13 years running from Saul. Sometimes there are some very hair-raising experiences. Eh? He's almost killed many times. Until God had to send somebody who became a very close friend of his, a son of Saul, and he's the one who tipped David most of the time. Saul wants to do this, do this, and do that. When you think of thriller movies, think of how David escaped from Saul through the help of Jonathan. Now, Joseph, he had to spend so many years before he became a prime minister, 
in Egypt. The brothers almost killed him. Potiphar's wife did not want to know, put him in prison. But God still did the thing that he wanted to do through him. Now look at Jesus. Jesus, when he is born, Herod is bent on ensuring that the Savior does not live. Until an angel tells Joseph and Mary, particularly Joseph being the head of the home, take this baby and run away to where? <laughs> to Egypt. Now that is where you're going, you're going to, to stay with the baby and stuff like that. So God's purposes, look at Jesus. Now the ultimate purpose of God to save mankind. But there's such great opposition from the devil to ensure that that does not happen. And it's not only then. Again, remember the temptations of Jesus. One of them was, bow down and worship me. And that would have been the end. Eh? But God does not allow that. Look at Paul. Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 23 to 29. 1 Corinthians 16, 23 to 29. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, 25. We are leading up to 29. Okay. We are reading 1 Corinthians 16, 23 to 29. Let me just forget it. Let me say what it says. And Paul faces a lot of opposition. And this is how he summarizes what he had been through. He was ostracized, beaten with sticks, flogged five times with a cut of nine tails, stoned, imprisoned, shipwrecked, and beaten by snakes. All those things. Now, he was the most influential person in the first century church. And he wrote half of the books in the New Testament. Now, the man Paul had such a divine purpose. But look at what the devil through other people, through the leaders had done. This fellow, he almost died. And it's not just through people because he was imprisoned, flogged and all that. But he almost died out of shipwrecks and stuff like that. There's a favorite verse that we like in book, the book of Philippians 4, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the context of that scripture, Paul is saying, I have known abundance and I have known lack. I have known what it is to be full and to be hungry. He is putting that verse against the adversity that he had faced. And he says, all these things do not matter unto me. So I bring to it, or to us, that as long as we are living out God's purpose and will for our lives, now we will always face opposition. Now the next thing I want us to see is what Nathan did. Nathan is privy to God's plan. And God himself has declared with his own mouth that Solomon will be king. But look at what is happening. So Nathan does not sit. This is when now he goes to speak to Bathsheba. You go speak to the king, eh? Go speak to him and ask him, did you say that Adonijah is going to be king? What is happening down there in the valley? And what can we hear? And Bathsheba says and tells the king, because it was custom those days, when you became king, you would do away with everybody else who was a threat. So one of the things that Nathan tells Bathsheba, you go tell the king these things. As you are talking, I will come in and confirm. Now David had a very soft heart for his sons, so he may not have believed Bathsheba. So Nathan is the one who tells him, you go speak to the king, and as you are talking, I will also do what? Come and put a rubber stamp upon the things that you are saying. 
the man of God who knew what God wanted and what God had predestined for Israel and for Solomon did not sit and watch. Sometimes I stretch my mind very far and ask, supposing Nathan had not done anything, what would have happened? I don't want to think beyond there. Let me stick to what is said. And I want to say, my people, that we cannot sit and watch as our purposes and our predestined futures go down the drain. It is not in our position to do that. The believer cannot sit and do nothing. We cannot watch because we know that which God has intended for us, for our families, for our nation, and for the world at large. And I want to bring in something that we normally say out there. We are here once. Our young people say YOLO. You only live once. This is the only time you have to fight for your health, to fight for your career, to fight for your children, to fight for your family. You don't have two lives. And it's got to happen here and here. Because once we are gone, we don't have that opportunity to demonstrate the power and the kingdom of God on earth. The Bible says, once down there, there is no work, all right? Let's fight. We cannot sit and do nothing. Now, the Bible says, after Nathan takes a step, and of course, Bathsheba is not complacent. She does, she does what she's supposed to do. Mordecai and Esther, they do something. They fast. They declare a fast, a dry fast, even for the animals. Eh? And the Lord came through. Now, Paul tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. We want to fight. We are not going to preach the gospel out there without opposition. We are not going to have the kingdom of God demonstrated in our families, in our careers, in our nation. Just by sitting, we've got to fight. We've got to, to go for the things that we know are ours. Now, Matthew eleven twelve. I hope this one comes up. Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. It is not on a platter. We are not going to have our lives on a platter and everything going on well, because we have seen ever since the creation of man. Now the devil is out to subvert, to sabotage, to usurp, and every other thing that we can say, that which God has for us during our tenure on earth. But we are going to take it by force. Now, Ephesians 6, 10 to 13, of course, we know what it says. Take on the full armor. Take on the full armor because it's going to be a fight. You will try to get a promotion. God is, has all the indications. He has spoken. You have seen it in your dream and in everything else. And people have spoken. But from the look of things, it will look like it will not happen. Like it will look like it won't happen for Solomon. So we cannot sit and watch. We take up the full armor. Let us be on our guard. The Bible says, for our enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion. Moving to and fro, looking whom he may devour. So do not put yourself in a position that is weak, that is helpless. We have a God who has such good intentions, a purpose, a will, and a future for us and our children. For the Bible says this kingdom is for us and our children. So let's fight. Let's stand up. Let's pray. Let us believe. Let us have faith. Now, if you look at what we've been saying and what, this, what the story is like, now God says help. Point number four, God, you said help. As we've been saying, as we thresh mountains, God says he's going to help us. The story that we have read, before Adonijah declares himself king, God says, Nathan takes a step, all right? And everything is turned towards God's intent and divine purpose. 
Now, after we fell at the Garden of Eden, God sent help through Jesus, all right, to save us and take us back. Now, God, of course, sent Moses to save the children of Israel. Now, Jonathan helped David big time, eh? So, God will send what? Help in his own way. Even if he comes himself, he will. Can you imagine Adonija there celebrating and he had slaughtered some fattened calves which were meant for sacrifice and other animals and declared himself king. The moment he hears that Solomon has been crowned the king and uh, Nathan and Zadok have anointed him, he fears. The same guy who had the commander-in-chief and Abiathar the chief priest on his side, he even runs to the temple. You know, as you run to the temple, you may not be killed eh? and stuff like that. So God will come, even if it means coming himself, but he will send help from Zion. Now remember, Psalm 121, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Whether he is a human being or he will come down himself, now he will send help. Just let us take our positions and stand. Let us not be complacent on matters the kingdom. Now, if we do that, God's will will prevail. And his purposes will come true. And we shall realize that all along, God is never defeated. Now, Moses, when they crossed the Red Sea, Miriam and the other people, they sang a song, a very beautiful song. And that is found in uh, Exodus 15. Now verse 3 says, God is a man of war. One as if you, God is a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. He ne we are the ones who sing, he never loses a what? A battle. He doesn't lose a battle. We, God is fighting for us. He will fight for us. Our careers, our missions, our visions, our families, and our nation, because he's a man of war. He never loses a battle. And when Miriam is leading the choir after crossing jo I mean, the Red Sea, you can imagine how life it was in them, what God had done, because the Israelites and the chariots had all been swallowed up, and God had demonstrated his power. One as if he He used Moses at Pharaoh's place, but when he came to crossing the Red Sea, and Pharaoh following with his chariots and all that, now, God ensured that his children had crossed on the other side and his divine purpose prevails. So, God's will will prevail. Now, please note the following, that divine purpose attracts opposition at any one particular time. That divine purpose will always attract opposition. Then, we face opposition when we are carrying out God's will. In fact, like some people, some scholars say, anytime you face a lot of opposition, and when, once you feel like everything is not working, then that could be a very clear indication that whatever it is that you are pursuing, because it is clear in you, it is God-given. So the bigger it is, the better it is for you, the more the opposition it will face, because the devil is up to that. Now, let's also remember that it is part of the package of a Christian walk. Now, Jesus told disciples, his disciples in John 15, 20, the, master, the, the servant is never, now remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they'll also keep yours. Now, take the first part. A servant cannot be bigger than his master. If they persecuted you, me, they'll also persecute you. And this is Jesus saying so. So it's part of it. It is part of our work. We've looked at many people, and seriously so speaking, nobody has ever had it that easy, carrying out God's purpose, God's will, and a passion to demonstrate the kingdom of God on earth. Because that is why we are here to do that. 
We normally sing, we are the chosen generation called upon to show his excellence. Now that excellence comes at a price, but we will do it. Remember, we don't have two lives to demonstrate that kingdom. In our own lives, in the lives of our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, and in the entire world. We have one chance to make an impact and to fight for the things that we believe in and advance the kingdom of God. One as if you. Now, in conclusion, I want to say once again that God's purpose will prevail despite opposition. And the believer must take their position. Build your faith. The Bible tells us to build ourselves in the most holy faith. And John 1, uh, the letter of John, for whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The world and everything in it is against us in many ways. Many ways. And the devil will use people. He will sabotage your family. He will sabotage your job. He will make things look like they're weird. They're not working for you. But we must stand. We must build ourselves in the most holy faith. Because that is the victory that overcomes the, the world. When you start and believe. Now, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he's telling Timothy, I guess, let us be steadfast and immovable. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The fact that he's telling him to be steadfast and to be immovable tells us there is something that he's studying against. All right? So you've got to be steadfast and you've got to be immovable. But remember that the Lord God, as Sarah Carey says, your helper is right inside you. And Jehovah is Nisi, the Lord our victorious banner. He's a man of war. So let us arise. Let us fight. Let us take that which belongs to us at whatever level, and we shall not be complacent. So I want to remind us a few things that we have talked about today. Number one, that God has a predestined purpose and will for each and every one of us, and it is beautiful. The Bible says, no one has had, no ear has had, no one has seen, or no eyes have seen, and no mind has perceived what the Lord has in store for those who love him. Number two, God's purpose and will face opposition. Number three, the believer cannot sit back and watch as the devil takes that which is ours. No, we can't. Number four is that God will said, help. Take your position and start. The battle belongs to who? to the Lord. And that number five, God's will and purposes will prevail. To my friends who are yet to acknowledge Christ and Lord and Savior, now many years ago before we were born, God planned for our salvation and he sent Jesus. So let's not be a partaker of what the devil has against us to destroy us. For indeed, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life and have it abundantly. So if you haven't believed, if you haven't partaken of this great salvation, now the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, says, Seeing therefore, it remained that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, 
harden not your hearts. In simplest terms, it says, since some who were intended to enter his rest have not entered re his rest because of their unbelief, he has created another day and called it today. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The Lord bless you, brethren. We are going to thresh mountains and we are going to achieve our purposes. And indeed, we are powerful instruments allied to purpose and we are going to thresh mountains. Let us remember our help comes from the Lord and our helper lives in us. I wish you victory in what you are praying for and what you are believing God for and may the year 2024 be that year that you are going to experience victory in that thing that you are believing God for. Bonus if you. The Lord bless you.